Okay, in this part of the video, I'm going to explain why it is that when you boil down the logic behind the scientific method of testing or yeah, testing theories through hypothesis tests or building theories through hypothesis tests, when you boil that down to the rules of formal logic, it makes clear why there is never any such thing as true scientific proof of a theory. And so a little bit about some uh, rules of formal logic here. So we're going to talk about a particular type of uh, logical syllogism, uh, an argument that goes, say, if A is true, then B is true, and then A is true, therefore B must be true. Uh, that's a particular form of a syllogism that is considered to be valid because a valid syllogism is one where um, it's a well-formed argument that has the properties that as long as both premises are true, it logically must follow that the conclusion must be true. And this argument has that shape. So let me give you uh, an example of that. Like, okay. The statement, if a person is born in Pennsylvania, then they are a U.S. citizen. So if born in Pennsylvania, then U.S. citizen. And then you point to a person and say, that person is born in Pennsylvania. Then it does logically follow that that person is a U.S. citizen. Okay. Well... Let me show you a different form of this syllogism that is invalid. And it's called a formal logical fallacy because formal in the sense of a badly formed or badly shaped argument. And it looks like this. If A is true, then B is true. B is true. Therefore, A is true. If we adapt this uh, example, uh, the um, illustration into this form, you can quickly see why this is a badly formed argument. So A was person is born in Pennsylvania, and B was is a U.S. citizen. So the claim, if a person is born in Pennsylvania, then they are a U.S. citizen. That person is a U.S. citizen, therefore, that person was born in Pennsylvania. All you need to do is think about any U.S. citizen you know who was not born in Pennsylvania, and you clearly see that this is an invalid argument because it's a badly formed argument, and this is a specific type of badly formed argument. This is called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Because in, you know, in the terminology of, uh, of formal logic here, in this form of an argument, A is the antecedent and B is the consequent. A is the antecedent, B is the consequent. And what you've done here is affirmed the consequent. So if antecedent is true, then consequence is true, consequent is true, and you've tried to use that uh, to prove that the antecedent is true, and that is a fallacy, and it's called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Okay, well, what does any of this have to do with scientific hypothesis testing and theory building and the notion of scientific proof? Well... Let's boil down the logic behind theory building through hypothesis testing by turning it into a simple syllogism. And the way it goes is if, I'm going to use T for theory is true, then H, hypothesis will be confirmed, or hypothesis is confirmed. So, the way we do scientific research is 
testing hypotheses that are derived from the theories by saying, all right, I've got this theory about what's going on here. And if my theory is a good theory, then I can make this hypo hypothesis prediction that I predict in this experiment, this is how it should turn out. Okay, then you test and you look to see, is your hypothesis confirmed? And then you try to conclude from that. Okay, again, if my theory is valid, then this hypothesis will be confirmed. The experiment will turn out in a certain way. And then you do the experiment and you say, ha ha, hypothesis is confirmed. It turned out the way I predicted. Does it then follow that your theory is true? Which one of these, the valid or the invalid form, does this look like? Well, it looks like this one. T to make the argument, if the theory is true, then the hypothesis will be confirmed. Aha, the hypothesis was confirmed, therefore the theory must be true, commits the fallacy of affirming the consequent. And for that reason, no number of times of repeating this does this ever add up to proving that the theory is true. Let's say, you know, you do this a thousand times. If the theory is valid, then a thousand hypotheses will be confirmed. And then you do those a thousand experiments and every single time, uh, you know, you, you come to add up to a thousand hypotheses have been confirmed it still doesn't logically follow that your theory is true because this is the form of this argument follows the form of an argument that commits the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Now, should this lead us as scientists to be disillusioned that, well, you know, scientific research by hypothesis testing is just worthless? Absolutely not. There's still tremendous value in that type of ev evidence gathering, and here's why. It has to do with the distinction between deductive versus inductive logic. Okay, so this here is a valid deductive argument. What makes an argument deductive is that it's a well-shaped argument that has the property that as long as the premises are both true, then the conclusion must be true. So for example, if you were born in Pennsylvania, then you're a US citizen. Well, that person is born in Pennsylvania, therefore that person is a US citizen. As long as this statement is true, which it is, if you're born in Pennsylvania, that makes you a US citizen. And as long as this statement is true, you know, okay, somebody could have lied to you and said they were born in Pennsylvania when really they were born in Azerbaijan. But as long as that is true, then these two things add up to this being true because it's a valid deductive argument. This over here is not a valid deductive argument but it could be still a worthwhile inductive argument. In an inductive argument, as long as the premises are true, it doesn't conclusively follow that the conclusion must be true, but the premises add some support for the conclusion. So for example, um, okay, so dogs bark and you're walking along a, uh, a brick wall that's 10 feet high, and you can't see on the other side of it, but you hear what sounds like a dog barking. It would be an inductive argument to think, well, that's the kind of sound a dog makes. Therefore, I hear that sound. I think there must be a dog on the other side of that. That's a, it's a reasonable inductive argument, but it doesn't prove that there's a dog on the other side of that wall. It could be uh, a, a person mimicking the sound of a dog, or it could be a TV show um, that, that sounds like a dog, or a tape recording of a dog barking. Let's take it back to this Pennsylvania example. Okay, if a person's born in Pennsylvania, then they're a U.S. citizen. That person was born, or excuse me, that person is a U.S. citizen. It does not prove that they were born in Pennsylvania, but Imagine you meet a person and have no information at all about them. You know absolutely nothing about them except that they appear to be a living human. 
and then the only thing they tell themselves about you, no, they tell you about themselves, is that they are a U.S. citizen. Okay. Before you learn that information, how likely is it the, to conclude that that person was born in Pennsylvania. It's actually vanishingly unlikely. If they could have been born anywhere in the world, it's not super likely that they were born in Pennsylvania. Okay, now you find out, yes, they are a U.S. citizen. Adding that information, it doesn't prove that they were born in Pennsylvania, but it does allow you to say, based on what I knew before, it now seems more likely that they could have been born in Pennsylvania that compared... Now, it, it still doesn't make it probable that they were born in Pennsylvania, but let's say you find out additional information. Okay, they, um, they pronounce water like water, and they root for the eagles, and they went to uh, high school at, um, you know, a, a, a private school that you happen to know is in... Uh, these are all little bits of evidence that none of them, no matter how many that you have, prove that they were born in Pennsylvania. But adding each bit of evidence there, it becomes a uh, reasonable inductive logic that these are all adding evidence that the person may have been born in Pennsylvania. And so this argument here that I said was an invalid deductive argument that would prove a theory, this is actually reasonable as an inductive argument, that if the theory is true, then the hypothesis will be confirmed in this experiment. Okay, the hypothesis is confirmed with the experiment. Again, doesn't deductively prove that the theory is true, but it's, it's potentially valid as an inductive uh, argument that the fact that this hypothesis was, cons uh, was confirmed adds weight of evidence to the conclusion that this theory could be true. Not proving that it is true, but uh, providing evidence that it could be. And because of this problem of logic, this is why as scientists we have to accept and make peace with and just come to, you know, sleep at night knowing that no amount of experimental research ever truly proves a theory true, what theory building by hypothesis testing does is each hypothesis test inductively adds additional evidence that a theory could be true and therefore should be accepted until something comes along that, uh, that challenges it and rules it invalid. I hope you found this video useful. If you're a student of mine watching this for class, yeah, maybe this will be on the exam. So feel free to let me know if you have any questions. If you're anyone else in the world who's just interested in the logic of scientific hypothesis testing, if you found this video useful, uh, feel free to make use of it. I'm releasing this under a Creative Commons license.